Hello everyone, my name is PJ and welcome to my new Let's Play of Demon's Souls. I love this game and this is the first PlayStation 3 game on the channel and it was not easy getting this all set up. My friend Tyler had to buy a couple of different things. Let me just get into new game real quick before I start talking. Wasn't that opening cutscene amazing? Welcome to Demon's Souls Online Mode. Yeah, here's the thing. Uh, I'm only going to be showing off online mode briefly. In the second episode onward, I'm going to be playing in offline, because that's the only reliable way to get and see everything. And there are a few exploits that you can do in online mode. And online mode is how you're supposed to play these games. It's supposed to be a co-op competitive experience, but there's no way I'm going to be able to show you everything unless I play offline, and I'm going to explain why, but first, I want to talk about a couple things. My friend Tyler had to buy a capture device called the Elgato. It was the only, it was the best HDMI capture device that we could find. We have a Dazzle, but that's for consoles with AV or RGB components, not HDMI, so the quality wouldn't have been as good. But the PlayStation 3 had this thing. Since it was the first console to be able to play Blu-ray movies, it encrypted the signal of anything that recorded from it to keep people from pirating Blu-rays. And the same thing happens to games, unless you use an HDMI splitter. That de-encrypts the signal. So, there was quite a lot of shopping around we had to do in order to get all of this working. And Demon Souls was in the lead of this poll, the poll that got this Let's Play started, for quite a long time. So I knew I'd be, I'd end up playing it. So we needed to get this stuff, not just for me, but for Tyler as well, since he does these kind of games on his live streams. And when we play the Insane Trilogy, we'll probably be using it then too. But yeah, Demon Souls. Bit of history. Demon Souls is the first of the Souls series, which I'm sure you must have heard of by now. Dark Souls, Dark Souls 2, Dark Souls 3, even Bloodborne. Demon Souls is the one that started this style of gameplay. But, there's a lot of discussion as to whether or not it is the first entry in this universe's story, because there were other games that had a lot of the stuff that's in these games, in like Kingsfield and Shadow Tower uh, and a bunch of other games made by FromSoft. Of course it could just be that FromSoft likes using recurring themes and elements and that they're not actually connected. There are a lot of people who say that Demon's Souls isn't even connected to Dark Souls. But then again there are also people who say that Dark Souls isn't connected to any of its sequels. There, it's one of those games where people talk about it and argue about it and try to figure out what all the connections are, even though, in the end, there might not actually be any. Now, I know a lot about the stories of Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 2, but not so much 3 or Demons, or even Bloodborne. Dark Souls 1 and 2 are my most played games, so trying to get into the story of this game, even though I've already beaten it twice, is something that I've never actually attempted. Because the Souls games don't explain their stories outright. They have stories. They have explanations for why things happen, but it's your job to find that stuff yourself. It's your job to talk to NPCs, find secrets, read item descriptions, in order to piece the puzzles together on your own. Otherwise, if you don't do that, the game is just a really difficult hack and slash RPG. So, before we actually get started with the game, a couple of things I want to go over. First, a new poll has been posted. A ton of people have already voted on it already, people who saw it early. If you want to vote on what my 16th Let's Play is going to be, the poll is in the description, as well as what game I'm going to be playing immediately after this. That one's got so many votes already, but once this Let's Play is over, that poll is going to get deleted, and then whatever the winner is will be what I play next. So if you haven't voted on that, go do so now before you forget. And finally, 
Shoutouts to my two Patreon patrons, King Ironside and Kazai Shoni. Your support means a lot to me. It really does. So, when you first boot up Demon Souls, you're given the option of making a character. I'm just going to play as a male character for now. There is male-only equipment and female-only equipment in this game. And, to be honest, the female equipment is way better. So, you really don't have a reason not to play a female character in this game. So, I'm just going to play as a male for this first video. But in the second video onward, I'm going to be playing as a different character in a different file. I just want to show off some stuff. Okay, so you can pick a gender, and you can edit your appearance however you like. Yeah, so West, East, South, and North are the only options you have for cultures in this game, even though there are actually locations in this world like Boletaria and Vinland. You could actually choose... It's mostly just for role-playing, but you can actually choose where you come from in later games. But here, you can only choose what general side of the world you came from. I'm gonna pick South. For some reason, I always like playing as black characters in Demon's Souls. Make them a bit older. I'm not gonna be like Morgan Freeman old, but you know. Give him a buzz cut. Make it nice and black. Now, I really need to fix his eyebrows and lips. I'm not going to be playing as this character for long, so I don't want to spend too long working on it. There we go. There we go. He looks a bit more natural now. Now, a lot of people complain about the character models in this game. Because they're like, oh, look at me with my big forehead. But I always thought they looked fine. People always complain that the FromSoft always makes, like, American-looking models to look like the freaking caveman or something. Because, I don't know, they like to joke about how that's what Japan thinks we look like. But none of the other NPC models in this game look bad. These ones don't look bad either. I don't know what they're talking about. And we'll keep you with the blue eyes, they suit you. Okay, what kind of name should you have? I always hated the PlayStation's freaking number pad system. Ah. Desmond. There we go. I think that name suits him. Okay, and the last thing to do is pick a class. Now, all class does in any of the Souls games is determine your starting stats and your starting gear. You can actually change anything you want about your character, except your appearance and gender and stuff, later on. Like, every time you level up, you can increase one of your scores by one point. So, even though the soldier, for example, starts with really low magic, all you gotta do is work at it, and magic can become your main highest stat. And even though you start with, like, heavy armor and a sword and shield and stuff, you could be wearing robes and casting spells with magic wands by the end. The starting class only determines the first few hours of the game. Although it does determine one other thing. This is the only game in the series that I can recall that can actually drain your levels from you. There are some enemies that can do that. And when your level goes down, the level, the attribute that drops a point is based on the class that you chose. So for the soldier, since magic is their lowest stat, magic is the stat that would be drained. So if you want to be a magic-based class, don't pick soldier. <laughs> because then every time your level gets drained, you'll lose a point in magic. And you don't want that. But you will want to pick some stats to be your dump stats. I should probably talk about what each of these stats actually do. Because it doesn't look like they give you the option of actually examining the stats right now to see what they do on your own. Okay, well, vitality is pretty obvious. That increases your max HP. And it also increases the total amount of stuff that you can carry. Usually these games have some kind of encumbrance system. 
but that usually just involves the actual armor and weapons that you have equipped. It doesn't actually focus on the items that you're carrying on you, like all the extra weapons. From Dark Souls onward, you had infinite carrying capacity. But in this game, you have encumbrance totals for both. Both stuff you can wear and stuff you can carry. And vitality increases the stuff you can carry. Intelligence increases your max MP and the no total number of magic spells you can have equipped. Spells in this game are very unique. Usually what you do is you equip a spell and the number of spells that you can have equipped is based on a number of slots. Kind of like D&D slots. Kind of. A little bit. Like, a regular spell might require one slot in order to equip it, but a stronger spell might require more than one slot. In the beginning of the game, typically players only have one or two slots, and by the end, they'll only have like four, maybe six, maybe more if they can get some special accessories and equip those. The point is that having a lot of different spells equipped at once, it's not easy. It takes a lot of work. It becomes easier in later games. Endurance does a lot of stuff. It increases your max stamina, which is a constantly regenerating score that you need to do pretty much everything. Attacking, rolling, running, blocking, everything other than just walking requires stamina. In order to recover it, you need to not do anything. And if you run out of stamina, it can be bad for you. So you want as much stamina as you can get, no matter what class you are. It also raises your maximum equipment weight, makes it so that you can wear heavier stuff without being slowed down. Increases fire resistance, poison resistance, and bleed resistance. Now, I don't remember if bleed does the same thing in this game as it does in later games, but what happens is, every time something that inflicts bleed attacks you, a bar fills up. And if it fills up all the way, you take a shit ton of damage. It's usually percentage based, like half of your max. It's pretty awful if you let the bar fill up, but if you just back off before the bar fills up and wait until it drains all the way, then you don't really have much to worry about. I think bleed has triggered on me like only a handful of times in any Souls game. It's not that big of a deal, but it can it can be a really big deal in PvP. And PvP is a big part of these games if you actually play online. The Demon Soul servers, this game is from 2009 by the way, the Demon Soul servers aren't really all that active. There was a point where they were going to shut down the Demon Soul servers, and then as like some kind of special event, a whole bunch of people on Reddit got together and decided that they were going to all log into the Demon Soul servers at once in order to play the game online one last time. Well, what ended up happening was it became so popular again after that point that they kept the servers up. <laughs> it, it's, it's amazing what the Dark Souls community can do. So, back on topic. Strength? Really obvious. It increases the amount of damage you do with melee weapons. Easy. Dexterity? Increases the amount of damage you do with dexterity-based weapons like rapiers and bows. Also decreases falling damage, although it does not decrease the amount of damage you take from a fall that's meant to instantly kill you, which there are a lot of in these games. These games, for some reason, tend to have platforming elements, even though you're not supposed to be able to platform. Like once in a while you will have a pit that you have to jump over, but your characters are never good at jumping, and in Demon Souls, you can't jump at all. So be careful. Magic increases the amount of damage you do with magic, but there is a difference between magic and miracles in these games. Well, uh, technically speaking anyway, the people in the world seem to imply that there is a difference, but they also seem to have the same sources. It's complicated and I don't know the details of it, but I'm sure we'll get into it later. But basically, miracles are like cleric spells. It's all about doing holy damage, or healing, or banishing evil, or protection, stuff like that. But there's a lot of healing and protection spells in magic as well. 
and magic is way more offensive, way more available, and way more useful. And there's a lot more magic spells. Faith is the stat that determines the effectiveness of miracles, and also apparently affects max stamina? I don't know how true that is. But it also raises magic defense, so that's good. In general though, miracles tend to be very underused, and I'm not sure why. They always put miracles in these games, but they never put enough of them in, and sometimes they make it so that you have to wait a really long time in order to get access to any of them. And despite all that, they're not even that good. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're really good, but then they nerf them in a patch. I don't really get the point. I typically don't touch miracles. Faith also affects the total number of magic slots you can have available. So if you want to be a really good magician, whether or not you're using miracles, you may want to increase your faith anyway. And finally, luck, which increases plague resistance, which I forget what that does, and increases item drop rate, which is more important than it sounds, especially if you have very, very little patience. Which, these games demand that you have patience. They're built around having patience. If you just try to rush into the game, you will die. More often than you would if you just took your time. That's how they're built. So, you can take a look at how the characters are up here. This is the class that we saw in the opening cutscene. The knight. Very average stats all around, but very low luck. So if you want item drops, and believe me, you want item drops, probably not the best class, because you can't actually level up until you've beaten the first boss that isn't the boss in the tutorial, the first real boss. Hunter has shit magic and faith. The priest has shit magic, dexterity, and luck. Seems to focus mainly on faith. The magician has really, really terrible faith but good intelligence and magic, so they can't equip many spells, but they've got strong spells. Their strength is low though, so they're not good at melee. The Wanderer, really high dexterity. Now, usually when people play these games, they try to choose between strength and dexterity, kind of like they do whenever they play most other RPGs, namely D&D. It's always usually one or the other, but in this game, a lot of weapons have high strength requirements, including the dexterity-based ones. Like the strongest bows have high strength requirements. But the amount of strength needed to equip a weapon is reduced either to half or to three quarters, I forget which, uh, when you double-hand it. Which when you're using a bow, you always double-hand it. So you don't need as much strength to use bows. But in general, people end up either focusing entirely on strength, or both. Sorry, dex users. The Barbarian has really high strength and vitality, makes sense. Above average magic for some reason. And really low intelligence, dexterity, and faith. Then we have the Thief, which has low strength and faith. It's a decent caster, and seems to focus mainly on dex weapons with low strength. And it has really, really high luck starting out. So, it might be a good class because starting out, enemies will be dropping healing items all over the place. In later games, you typically have rechargeable healing items. It's particularly the Estus Flask. But this game doesn't have that. Instead, you have consumable healing items. You may even want to get yourself a healing spell as soon as you can. Temple Knight. Uh, basically a cleric, I guess. Looks kind of like a cleric. Maybe a Templar. There's low intelligence and low magic, but really high faith. Doesn't really mix well with the low intelligence, though, does it? Hmm. And it, terrible luck. This does not seem like a very good class. A lot of these classes are probably just for role-playing purposes. Because a lot of people who play these games like to say, Oh, I'm a Temple Knight, this is how my character is going to act, these are the quests my character is going to do, this is the 
karma that my character is going to have, etc., etc. Now, royalty is the class a lot of people start as, start as mainly beginners, because they start with something very good. I don't know if you can see it on his model, but royalty starts with a very powerful ring called the Fragrant Ring, which gives you MP regeneration. It recovers 1 MP every 4 seconds, and since the MP in this game runs out pretty damn fast unless you have a lot of MP healing items, having something that constantly regenerates it is really good for a character with good magic stats like this one has. All of its other stats suck though, but it's also level 1, which means it'll cost less, less experience, I'm gonna call it that for now, to level it up in the beginning of the game. But it will cost more total souls for it to reach max level in the long run. You don't really, really need the Fragrant Ring starting out, because you can get it rather early if you know where it is. And then we're back at the Soldier. So, like I said before, you pretty much need to pick which stats you want to dump. All of these stats are useful in their own ways. All of them. Which isn't something that later Souls games can claim. Later Souls games typically have one or two stats that everybody dumps, regardless of their build. But in this game, ooh, it's a really, really tough choice. Kind of makes me want to level them all up equally. The Wanderer isn't a bad job, actually. Starts with really high dexterity. All of its other stats are average or above average, except for its two main magic stats, but they're not so far below 10 that I can't raise them after just a few levels. And its luck starts off really high, too. I think I'll go with this one. Okay, Desmond. So, we're gonna start the game up. And I don't know what else the Wanderer starts with. I doubt it starts with any spells. King Alant the Twelfth, by channeling the power of souls, brought unprecedented prosperity to his northern kingdom of Boletaria. That is, until the colorless deep fog swept across the land. Boletaria was cut off from the outside world, and those who dared penetrate the deep fog never returned. But Valarfax of the royal twin fangs broke free from the fog and told the world of Boletaria's plight. That the old king Alant had aroused the old one, the great beast below the nexus, from its eternal slumber. And that a colorless fog had swept in, unleashing terrible demons. The demons hunt down men and claim their souls. Those who lose their souls also lose their minds. The mad attack the sane, and chaos reigns. Valarfax spoke of the enticing power of the demon souls. Each time a demon claims a human soul, the demon's own soul is invigorated by the life force. And the power of a mature demon soul is beyond human imagination. The legend spread quickly. Mighty warriors were drawn to the accursed land. But none have returned. Bjor of the Twin Fangs. Yurt the Silent Chief. Sage Urbane. Skurber the Wanderer. The Sixth Saint Astraea and her knight Garo Vinland. And Sage Frake the Visionary. The colorless deep fog slowly creeps beyond Boletaria's borders. Humankind faces a slow and steady extinction. The deep fog will eventually swallow all lands near and far. But Boletaria has one final hope. A lone warrior who has braved the baneful fog. Has the land found its savior? 
Or have the demons found a new slave? Okay, so, story of this game. In the opening cutscene, the very first one that you saw in this video, it said that on the first day, humankind was created and given consciousness and free will. On the second day, a terrible demon showed up that could eat people's souls. Lovely. So, now that demon has been awoken, supposedly by King Alant, and it's causing this terrible fog to spread from the kingdom of Boletaria outward. And it's causing demons to show up who are eating people's souls and turning them insane. And now everybody in the world seems to think that if they go to this place, then they can get some of those souls for themselves and become more powerful. So a lot of greedy people have come here in search of power. A lot of good people have come here in search of power in order to try and stop all of this. And we came here. For what reason? That's up to you. Isn't for power? Isn't for wealth? Isn't for fame? Isn't for the greater good? That's all just role-playing stuff. Would you like to play the journey to the Nexus? Basically it's asking if you would like to play the tutorial level. And yes we would, because it's just a part of the story as the rest of the game. And once in a while you'll see a loading screen that shows one of the main characters of the game, Bjor of the Twin Fangs. What was weird about those characters, you never have to meet half of them. And I haven't even met some of them. Brave soul who fears not death. I shall guide you. So that you may lull the old one back to slumber. Yeah, and just so you don't get any weird ideas, that wasn't a girl talking. That was, in fact, a little boy. At least I'm pretty sure it's a little boy. Looks like a boy. But whatever. Uh, anyway. So, here's the game. In the top left, you have your HP, MP, and Fatigue. Every time you roll or run, it drains and depletes. And if you run out of Fatigue, then you won't be able to do all of those things until it fills back up. Which means you won't be able to block attacks and enemies will get more free hits on you. In the bottom, you have your items. The top one, which you cycle through with the up button on the D-pad, Cycles through your equipped spells. We don't have any. I guess not. Not with this class. Right, let's do switch between weapons. This appears to just be a regular dagger. And this, a falchion? I think it's a falchion. And on the bottom, you have your regular healing items. Ed's a grindstone? Um, I don't remember what that's for, but... Uh, the Crescent Moongrass is the basic healing item of the game. You'll find tons of this shit. Without even trying, you'll probably get like 99 of them. And on the left, left button, swaps shields out. If you have two shields, it'll switch between them. If you have just the one, hitting left will put it away. Which is important if you want to hit triangle and double hand your weapon. Although I think you can do that with the shield out. If you pull the shield out and hit triangle anyway, then you'll just temporarily put it on your back. And then when you hit triangle again to single hand your weapon, you'll get the shield back out. So you never really hit, need to hit left. When you're double handing a weapon, you do more damage. And you get a slightly different attack combo. You attack with R1, by the way. Uh, for some people, that might uh, take a bit to get used to. R2 is a heavy attack. Slower, but does more damage. Oh, that, that, would look, that would look cool. Wow. Wow. Yeah, but if you're double-handing a weapon, then holding an L1 will let you block with it. But weapons tend to make terrible shields. So it's better to just get your shield out and block with that. But it takes a second. So you gotta be quick. You need to be preemptive when you block attacks. If you hit L2, 
you can parry. And I don't know why I'm telling you all this stuff. The tutorial is going to tell us all of it. <laughs> in fact, let's just, let's just get right into it. Right here on the ground we have a glowing message written on the ground. That was us how to attack. We already know. Our three locks on to enemies. And so many people try playing these games and don't know how to lock on. And then they get fucked. Hmm, I wonder why he wasn't attacking me. Also, these games have hilarious ragdoll physics. <laughs> it's been the subject of ridicule for years. I just realized this game is eight years old. Almost nine. Huh, wow. Direction. Yep, hold in circle while you're walking to sprint. And that drains your fatigue over time. If you don't do anything, your fatigue fills up faster. But if you hold in the block button while it's recharging, then it fills up slower. So you need to drop all of your defenses in order for it to fill up quickly. Yep, now one is guard, which means this next enemy should attack me. Yeah, you'll notice that I still took a teeny bit of damage even though I blocked the attack. Different shields have different physical damage reduction. A lot of them have 100%, but this one is not a very good shield. I'd say it probably has maybe 90%, 70 at the least. Yeah, but shields are very important in the first few Demon Souls games. I say first few because the newer ones tend to focus on dodging and rolling more than blocking. Armor is practically useless in the newer games, it's sad. Yep, R3. Let's you lock on to an enemy, and hitting left and right on the right joystick lets you swap between visible enemies. I don't think it will let you swap to an enemy that's not on screen. So just keep that in mind. And enemies will try to attack through their allies to get to you, so keep your eye on all enemies. Let's see, I keep thinking these flames are items. They look very similar to the item drops. With little yellow soul things. Also, in the bottom right corner... Oh, see that? That's another player. We can see his ghost. Somebody else is playing this area right now. Right as I'm playing it. That's not from the past or anything. That's always been one of the coolest parts of these games. Is that, uh, these games tend to focus on, like, having crossed dimensions. So you can see other players playing in their worlds. And at any time when you're playing online, except in the tutorial area, you can't do that here, somebody else can invade you. Why do I get the feeling I'm seeing that same image over and over again? Is the server lagging? Um, hmm. Never mind. I think... I think that's predetermined. I think that's scripted. Yeah, never mind. I think it's just there to teach you that there are ghosts. But you can't do anything with them, and they can't do anything with you, so don't worry about them. Look at you. Look at this fucker. Is that just gonna keep going forever? And your sword's missing its tip. Fuck you thinking. Yeah, but all these people lost their souls, so they're crazy now. They'll attack anyone who has a soul on sight. Crescent Moongrass. Oh, hey, this looks like the... This is the knight outfit. Hmm. I wonder if that's supposed to be the guy whose ghost we were just shown. I don't know. It's difficult to say in these games, because... The whole nature of crossed dimensions and crossed worlds and all that stuff is ambiguous on purpose. Like, you could kill a character in this game and still run into them in another version of that world. It's really difficult to explain. Yeah, Square is using an item. That's pretty simple. You, it's Square and you heal yourself, but I don't want to waste my grass. And in the bottom right, we really don't have many, but that's your soul counter. Souls in this game act as both experience 
and money. You can spend your souls to buy things, or you can spend them to level up. It's kind of an ingenious system. It makes sense that money, as it were, is never useless. In Dark Souls 1, you can actually find copper, silver, and gold coins, but you can't do anything with them. Nothing special, anyway. Okay, looks like we have to fall down here. Yeah, and you do take a little bit of fall damage from falls. The more dexterity you have, the less you'll take. I didn't take much from that. Backstep. Yep, if you just hit circle while you're standing still, you do this. It takes a bit of stamina, but it gets you out of the way pretty quickly. Although, most people never use it. It's a very, very situational thing. And most people will either just roll or block. I've been trying to backstab enemies. If you lock onto them and get behind them, you can do this! Which does like triple damage, I think. Up. Oh. And keep your ears peeled. You can hear enemy footsteps. And they love to sneak up on you. And jump at you. Hey, here's where we were before. Where we saw that ghost. Over and over and over again. Oh, hello. Almost didn't see you. Okay, and then up here we have what's called an archstone. These are the checkpoints in this game. And they let you teleport, but this is the only time we'll ever use this one, and it's one way. Selen Vinland, another character with a really cool sword that I've never had the privilege of obtaining. Hopefully, I'll get to see everything in this playthrough. Strong attack. Yep. Let's see how that fares. Yeah. And you can't backstab with strong attacks. You can only do it with R1. Let's see. Another note. Parry. Yep. Time to show that off. Let's see if I can actually do it, because parrying is one thing that people struggle with a lot in these games. So you wait until they're swinging at you. Not when they're getting ready to swing, but when they're swinging. And then you hit L2. Come on. There we go. And then you attack them and stab them in the stomach. And that does more damage than a backstab, because it's much harder to pull off. Luckily, if you fail to parry, swinging your shield at them still reduces the damage you take slightly, so you don't have to worry about taking tons of damage while you're trying to parry someone. Let's try that on you. Perfect. One hit! And these knights with the glowing helmets are supposed to be really tough. So, you basically want to fish for backstabs and parries on tough enemies. That's one of the problems people tend to have with these games, though, is that they turn into just backstab fests, because it's really easy to do and it does tons of damage. But in Dark Souls 2, once they made it all the more difficult to parry and backstab, people stopped doing it. Roll opens with both hands. Might as well try it. Okay, come here, buddy. I'm not gonna parry you. Since I'm double-handing, I can't block your attack, so I'll have to be a bit more evasive. You're not gonna attack me, are you? They want me to pierce your guard break. Or they want me to guard break you. Yeah. Uh, one thing it hasn't taught me to do yet is if you hit up and attack at the same time, the hell was that? I don't know what that was. But if you keep attacking something that's guarding, then eventually their poise will break. And they'll let go of their shield and stop guarding. Because every time you block somebody with your shield, 
it drains your fatigue. And if your fatigue is drained all the way, you can't guard it anymore. So then you can get free attacks on them. But every time you attack, it also drains your fatigue, so you might not be able to perform such an attack once both of your fatigue bars are drained. Change weapon, change item, yeah, yeah, yeah. Half moon grass. Stronger than crescent moon grass. Basically, the fuller the moon is in the name of the grass, the stronger it is. It's pretty simple. Crossbow people. And arrows are really slow in Souls games. So you never have to worry about having trouble dodging arrows. Okay, where am I supposed to go now? Ah, over here. Okay. Yeah, always be vigilant. Always be looking around, because Souls games love to hide enemies behind corners and stuff like that, and they love to ambush you. Also, you can't backstab anybody if you're not on the same exact elevation as them, so don't try to do it on stairs. Stab! Crescent moon grass. Now right over here, we have this gap. It looks like you should be able to jump over there, but you can't. You might be able to roll over to there, but I'm not going to risk it. Yeah, there's no jumping in Demon Souls. They wouldn't add that to the next game. Now here we have the first fog gate. Basically, all this does is act kind of like a loading zone, kind of. It disappears once you go through it, but in other areas, fog gates will dictate how difficult it is for other players to assist or help you. Or to invade you. Because they can't go through fog gates themselves. And I think when they invade you, any fog gates that you've opened reclose. So it keeps you trapped in a smaller area and makes it easier for invaders to find you. Yeah, but in these games, you can invade other people's worlds. Any enemies that they've killed will be dead for you when you get there. And you can meet another player wandering around with their own level, their own equipment, and possibly even an ally summoned. And then you can kill them. And it won't do any good for your karma, because that's the system in this game is what's called character tendency. Every time you do something bad, like kill an innocent person or another player, your character tendency goes down. And I don't remember if people treat you any differently, but there are items and side quests in this game that you can't access unless you have maximum or minimum character tendency. So you need to do good things in order to get some stuff and bad things in order to get other stuff. It's very difficult to get everything in one playthrough. You gotta go back and forth. Now, here is the first boss. This is not a mandatory boss, though. You can skip the tutorial or not fight this guy, and you don't have to beat him. I have never beaten him. We'll see how well I do. I did really good once when I was playing a character that I started with fire magic. Yeah, be careful and keep a constant eye on him. He's got a lot of health. Whenever he flies up like that, get away from him because the shock wave will hurt you. Oh, shit! Get up! Yeah... A lot of really powerful attacks will pierce your defense and just do tons of damage. And then you're out of fatigue, and then you can't do anything. You can't roll out of the way, you're just stuck there, sitting like a duck, and then you're dead. <sighs> Never beaten that guy. I'll, I'll, I'll manage it someday. When I start my second character, I'll probably go ahead and try that.
drawn from its vessel. Let strength be granted so the world might be mended. So the world might be mended. the northern land of Boletaria. Thou canst not exit the Nexus, but each of the five arch stones will connect them to the You have died. Actually died. And the Nexus has trapped your soul. You cannot escape the Nexus. Yeah. However, by capturing demons' souls, with the apostrophe after the S this time, you can reclaim your physical body. Yeah, that's something that people often complain about with this game is the grammar in the title. They always talk about how it doesn't make any sense and how the apostrophe should be after the S. Because it's the souls of multiple demons, right? But here's the thing. Souls in this game aren't one-to-one. -one. A single creature can have one soul, or they can have a soul that's worth multiple souls. How, how it works is, um, like a blade of grass, for example, is still a living thing, and it does have a soul. But just one soul. One soul. It's worth one soul. A person might have a soul that's worth five, or if they're really strong, hundreds. And really powerful demons, thousands. Maybe even tens of thousands, or hundreds of thousands, depending on just how powerful they are. So, when it says demon's souls, it could be referring to multiple souls from one demon. It's still grammatically correct, but it still doesn't make sense because it's not specifying which demon. And there's more than one demon, so you know. Next to your binding. This... I don't know why it looks like a ring. Basically, it's just an item that lets you kill yourself if you happen to get stuck and return to the Nexus. Whenever you die in this game, except for this first time apparently, you drop all of the souls that you're carrying in what's called a bloodstain, and you return to the last checkpoint or to the Nexus, whichever. And then if you want to get those souls back, you have to find and examine your bloodstain in the spot where you died before dying again. If you die without picking up your bloodstain, then that bloodstain will disappear and you'll make a new one where you've dropped whatever souls you're carrying at the time. Now, you'll notice that our maximum health has been capped at half of its capacity. That's because we are now in soul form. See how we're kind of glowing? This is basically what we're going to be looking like for the rest of the game, because it's typically not a good idea to play in body form. You can recover your body by using these very specific items, or by defeating bosses, by defeating demons. Or, you could just stay in this form. People typically have accepted that this is the normal form. Having half health in this game is normal. You're supposed to be in soul form. Because if you die in soul form, then you're not further penalized. It's only dying in body form that makes you lose things. It lowers the status of the world you died in. Makes it so that certain events become unavailable to you. Cuts your health in half. And makes it so that you can't play online with other people. Because you can only summon other people to help you with the game when you're in body form. I think you also have to be in body form in order to be invaded. But since it's so difficult to stay in body form, people typically don't bother. Unless they're really good at the game and they hardly ever die. Or they have a lot of the item that turns you into body form again. But what I meant before when I said that it lowers the status of the world you're in, there are five worlds in this game, not counting this one or the tutorial area. There's that one, that one, that one, that stone is broken. 
that one and that one. And if you go to, into your menu, which I haven't shown yet, you have this thing called World Tendency. And this confuses so many people, and almost all of the people who play this game never even bother with it or worry about it. This is your World Tendency. You have a humanoid figurine in the middle that represents your character tendency, or your karma. Every time you do something bad, it gets blacker, and every time you do something good, it gets whiter. Same goes for these stone tablets, each of which represents one of the five worlds of the game. Every time you defeat a demon in a world, it gets brighter. Every time you die in that world, it gets darker. Certain special things happen in these worlds though when you have it at maximum white or maximum black and the only way to see everything is to get it to both for each world and for yourself now you'll notice i said that it, they typically only get blacker if you die in a world that's only if you're in body form though if you lose your body in a world that world tendency gets blacker so what you do is every time you beat a boss and regain your body, come back to the Nexus, and kill yourself. Just jump off of one of the ledges up above. You'll be able to go right back up, safely pick up the souls you dropped, and you'll be back in soul form, and none of your world tendencies will be affected negatively. You see what I mean? You typically want to play this whole game in soul form. Which means that playing online with other people isn't something that happens often. And they wouldn't even make specialized PvP arenas until the DLC for the next game. They really didn't think the whole online process through, did they? And before we talk to any NPCs, you can come down here and there is a shit ton of messages on the floor. Mostly just hints about how to play the game. But some of these, I think, may have been left by players. With no stamina, your shield defense is ineffective. Stamina is consumed by attacking, blocking with shields, and sprinting. This is all stuff I explained to you. Yeah, maybe there aren't any player messages here. When your stamina bar depletes, you cannot perform actions which consume stamina. If you lack certain ability points, your weapon will be useless. Yeah, that's going into the thing I said before about how Weapons and armor have certain stat requirements, usually strength. If you are overburdened with equipment, your movement speed will be drastically decreased. Using a weapon with both hands causes your strength to be enhanced by 50%. Yep, so double-handing a weapon lets you do 1.5 times the damage. If you use a weapon with both hands, you can break an enemy's guard. Really? I think I tried that and it didn't work. Maybe I just wasn't trying hard enough. Because if you double hand and use heavy attacks, you also get different combos. Or not. Maybe he just ignores the whole double handed thing. I don't know. I guess maybe it depends on the weapon. Because even though there are weapon categories in this game, like you have your straight swords, for example, just because you have two different swords of the same category doesn't mean that they will have the same attacks. Every weapon in this game has a different set of combos. And one combo might be more useful, even if it's weaker than another weapon with a different combo. It's up to you to test out all these different weapons and figure out which ones you like. Not just which ones are strongest. When in soul form, your HP is halved. When a weapon becomes worn or its durability gets low, its attack power decreases. Yeah, I might as well show that off too. Yeah, if you go into Equipment, and take a look at your Falchion... Okay, yeah, you see that weird symbol with the number 114 next to it? I think that's the weapon's durability. Every time you attack with it, it goes down a little bit. It goes down faster if you attack really hard things, like metal or stone. Wooden Shield's durability goes down if whenever you block something with it. And I think some shields, I don't know if they're in this game, but some shields can also be used as weapons. Like you can bash things with them. I think those are the tower shields. The number on the far right is their weight. I don't know if it's in pounds or kilograms or what. But you'll see that my equipment burden 
I'm currently equipped with 11.6 pounds worth of stuff. Now, I think as long as I remain under 20, I can roll at normal speeds, like so. But once it goes over 20, my roll will be slowed. And once it goes over 40, I think I become incapable of rolling entirely. I don't remember exactly how it works because it's different every game. They're constantly trying to change the system, trying to fine-tune it and balance it and make it fair for everybody. But it never works. Not really. The blacksmith can repair weapons that have become worn. Yeah, the blacksmith's right up there. We haven't talked to him yet. We must equip a catalyst to use spells. I don't have any catalysts. So, I might have to buy one. You must equip a talisman to use miracles. Yeah, so, you need a different spellcasting focus for each category of magic. And each one, you can bet your ass, will have different stat requirements. Talismans will probably have faith requirements. You can leave messages with select. Oh, really? I can just leave them anywhere? Oh, not in the Nexus, though. You can't leave messages in the tutorial or in the Nexus. These messages are sent to other worlds. Basically what that means is, when I'm in a world, I can hit select and choose to leave a message, but I can't type in anything I want. I have to use the keywords that it gives me, so that I can't type cursed words or say demeaning things to people. But the point of the messages is to give other people hints and warn them of things like traps or ambushes or tell them where hidden items are. Or you can leave false messages. You can tell them, hey, fall down this hole, there's a secret, and then they fall and die. People do that in this game. This game, these games kind of encourage you to be a dick. Phantoms are warriors of another world, much like the one you fight in now. When you die, a bloodstain will be left at the location of your death. Yeah, I explain that. If you touch your own bloodstain, you can regain the souls you lost upon death. If you touch another warrior's bloodstain, you can view the manner in which he or she died. So yeah, if I died and left a bloodstain, somebody else can see that bloodstain. They can't take the souls I dropped or anything, thank God. But if they examine it, they'll see a vision of what I was doing a few seconds before I died. And then they'll see me die. They won't see the thing that killed me, but by examining bloodstains, you can see how other people died and get the feeling that, hmm, maybe I shouldn't walk onto that tile on the floor, or maybe I shouldn't just walk around that corner without checking to see if there's an enemy waiting for me there. It's actually a pretty ingenious system, but for some reason most people ignore bloodstains. Like I said though, most people who play these games assume that they're going to be the same happy-go-lucky hack-and-slash kind of games that they're used to, but they're n it's not like that at all. If you rush in this game, you will die. Simple as that. If the tendency is closer to black, demons will pose more of a threat. Uh, so that's that karma thing I was telling you about. If a world tendency or if your character tendency is too low, enemies will become tougher and you will become weaker. However, drop rates for rare items will increase, so it, it still kind of rewards you for being bad. Pay attention to the tendency of the world's souls. If the tendency is closer to white, the demon's powers are weakened. Yeah, white tendencies do the opposite. They make you stronger and enemies weaker, but they also lower drop rates. So who knows, it might be better to start with black and then work towards white, but it's much easier to reach black than it is to reach white. Reaching white is very, very difficult unless you play in online mode and have some help, or unless you go into New Game Plus. But New Game Plus, when you beat the game, you're given the option of playing the game over again with all of your levels and equipment and stuff, and that your tendencies carry over too. So it gives you another chance to get pure white or pure black and whatever you weren't able to do before. But, in New Game Plus, all of the enemies become twice as hard. And it typically 
it typically encourages people to stop playing. I myself have never beaten this game in New Game Plus. It gets way too hard for most people at that point. Just beating the game on its own is too hard for most people. Imagine you're making it twice as hard. Yeah, but that's enough of that. Now we're going to talk to people. And try not to accidentally attack anybody, because then they'll become hostile, and there's no way to pardon your sins in this first game. They didn't add that into the next game. Let's talk to you. Well, you slipped through the fissure too, did you? You came for demon souls? Or to save this land and be remembered as a hero? <laughs> Hunting for demons? Try one of the art stones. Now go. That is why you came, is it not? To this accursed volatile area. Yeah, so this is the Crestfallen Warrior. Pretty much every Souls game has a character like this. A character who just sits and mopes because he's given up and wants to tell other people to give up because he's a pessimist. And that's all they really do, is whine and complain and try to tell people that it's hopeless. Try to convince you that it's hopeless. And then you end up trying to show him up. But it doesn't do him any good. You came for demon souls? Or to save this land and be remembered as a hero? It's all the same. You're just another prisoner of the Nexus. We're welcome here, as long as we keep slashing up demons. <laughs> yeah, and you can see by the fact that he's glowing blue, he doesn't have a body either. Now these people, they're not glowing. They seem to actually have their bodies. They haven't died. But this guy has probably died a lot. And that's why he's given up. That's why he's so hopeless. Okay, he pretty much just does the same thing from this point forward. But here's the thing. If you ever get to a point in this game where you talk to him and it sounds like he doesn't remember you and you've exhausted all of his dialogue, the next time you load this area, he'll be gone. And in his place will be his soul that you can take for yourself. Now, if you want to get pure black character tendency, this is one of the safest characters to murder. So, you don't want to exhaust his dialogue unless you plan on killing him right away. And I would recommend not killing any friendly NPCs until you've gotten the reward for pure white character tendency. Now we'll talk to this guy. This guy is going to be our blacksmith for pretty much the rest of the game. There's another blacksmith in this game, but I think he has a slightly different purpose. Hmm. You new here? You here for my services? My name's Baldwin. Just an ordinary blacksmith. It's simple. Just bring me all the souls you can. In trade, I'll give you weapons, or forge ones you already have. With your souls, I can eke out a living. My weapons. You can go on living. Not a bad deal, huh? Yep, so Blacksmith Baldwin. He's got a cool voice, doesn't he? So, you can repair your stuff, like my falchion. And it tells you how many souls it takes to do so. For this, it's 25. Yeah, you'll have to repair your stuff a lot. I hardly got hit in the tutorial, so none of my armor is damaged. You can also upgrade your weapons if you get the correct stones. Like if I wanted to upgrade my falchion, for example, it requires shards of sharp stone, which I don't have. I can also just buy items from him, including Ed's grindstones. Oh, okay, that's what that does. It lets you repair your weapons during the stages without having to go back to the blacksmith. That's pretty cool, but they're really expensive, so uh, maybe don't even bother using the ones that you have on hand <laughs> until you can afford more, because goddamn, 
Also, you typically don't want to stick with one weapon for the whole game. You want to try and upgrade a multitude of different weapons. Like, you'll want one that does blunt damage and one that does piercing damage for the different enemies with different resistances. You'll probably want to get a blunt, dam blunt uh, weapon as soon as possible for skeletons, because skeletons are the first enemies you fight in World 4, and they are hard. You can buy more Crescent Moongrass from him, but it costs 150 souls apiece. That's not going to be too expensive later on, but in the beginning you're better off just farming them from enemy drops. Fresh Spice recovers MP, doesn't do me any good, I don't have any spells. Not with this character anyway. And you can buy other weapons from him, though he doesn't have a fantastic selection. I don't know if his selection ever expands later in the game. Yeah, but I really wish it didn't use these stupid symbols. Because it's so difficult to tell exactly what they mean and what they do. I can give you a general idea of what these mean right now. Uh, that one symbol right there in the middle with the letter E to the right of it, next to stat bonuses, that represents strength scaling. Its rank is E. So, let's say you've got like 20 strength and you're using a dagger. The dagger has E scaling and strength, so it might use... It might add maybe like 10%-ish of your strength score to the weapon's attack power. That's not much. D is a teeny bit higher. That'll add, I want to say maybe 20 to 40-ish percent of your dexterity score to the weapon's attack. Typically, you'll want to upgrade your weapons until these ranks are like B or A, or if you can get that high, S. But most weapons, unupgraded, only have D and E scaling and things. And the heater shield doesn't have any deck scaling. Ooh, but it does have 100% physical damage reduction. I might want to get my hands on that as soon as I can. Medium-sized metal shields. It's easy to handle, its use is widespread, especially amongst the soldiers of the church. And this is how you learn the actual lore of this game, is by examining all these items. But I'm not going to worry about that right now, we'll save that for later. And we can talk to him some more. Perhaps you've already heard, but there's another blacksmith at the entrance of Stonefang Mine. He's an eccentric old man, but he knows his trade well. He's the only sane one left in a town of soul starved men. If you do meet him... Yeah, well, forget it. That stubborn old near the well will just ignore you. Yeah, so he's talking about the other blacksmith, whose name is Ed, by the way. Wait. Oh, it's that Ed, that same Ed. So you have some of his grindstones? Huh. What does this say, anyway? A sharpening stone used by Ed, the blacksmith of Stonefang. Oh, okay. There's nothing really new there. Usually items like this, that are based on a character, will usually, like tell you a bit about the character too, but that probably wasn't as much of a thing in Demon Souls as it was in later games. There aren't enough blacksmiths in this temple to handle all the work. Only certain ores can be used to forge weapons, but you just have to make do. And be thankful that I'm still of good health. And be thankful that I... You come back alive. I need your business. Will do. Now this guy is your storage guy. I'm Stockpile Thomas. When the scourge came, I didn't know what hit me. When I came to, I found myself here, in the Nexus. My wife and daughter fell victim to the demons. But I would be worthless in battle. At the very least, I hope to lend my assistance to you brave slayers of demons. I would be happy to lighten your load and look after any excess baggage. Yep, so he seems suspicious to a lot of people when they first play the game, but you can trust him. As long as you don't kill him, you can deposit items with him. Anything that you don't want to be lugging around with you, like these. Each of these weighs a third of a pound. My current item burden is 90 pounds. That's how much stuff I can carry at once. 
Stores are weightless, obviously. So you don't have to store those if you don't want to. And I'm using everything else, so I don't really have anything else to store. Huh, okay, it looks like your equipped stuff still goes toward your total item burden. So, yeah, it might be best to increase that item burden as high as you can. Which means increasing your vitality as high as you can, which you want to do anyway, since it increases your max health, and you play the game at half health for its entirety. Rest assured, your goods are safe and sound with me. Best of luck to you. Wasn't quite done talking to you. When the scourge came, I abandoned my wife and daughter and fled like a madman. When I came to, I was in the Nexus. I haven't dared venture outside these walls since. I wish I could do more, but I am ignorant of the world beyond these walls. Yeah, so the Nexus... I'm not sure exactly where this place is located. It might be another dimension. But whenever people die, their souls come here. And using the Nexus's power, you can still interact with the physical world. Or maybe you can only do that because of the fog. I'm just guessing here. But demons can't get in here. Most of them. That candle maiden cared for me during my first days in the Nexus. She says very little, but has a kind heart. She's just the age my young daughter would have been. The poor, poor girl. Trapped here with her eyes occluded by wax. If only something could be done to help her. Yeah, we didn't get a chance to look at the Maiden in Black's face, but her eyes are completely covered by wax. I'm not sure, but I think she did that herself. I'm not sure. Um, the series has a minor recurring theme where these girls who help you out need to be blind. It's only really been in this game and in Dark Souls 3, but it helps them see something when they're blind. I don't know. I don't know as much of the lore of these games as other people do. Best of luck to you. Yep, so Stockpile Thomas is a nice guy. Now, if you come back here, meet this woman sitting on this ledge here. Oh my. How has this happened? Has God abandoned us for failing to show proper respect to King Alant? Oh, Mbasa. Umbasa. <laughs> that was a meme for a while. Uh, basically, it's, um, how do I put this? It's kind of like a curse. Instead of saying, oh shit, or oh god, they say, oh Umbasa, a lot. And even though later games would refer to multiple gods, this one seems to be primarily monotheistic. They only have one god, and they refer to it as god. That doesn't really have a name. Oh, Mbasa. Yeah, as you can see, that's all she does now, is just say that over and over again. But I think if you get your faith high enough, or maybe just after you beat the first real boss, uh, she'll become a miracle salesman. Miracle merchant. And over here... is supposed to be a guy who sold magic, but I guess he doesn't need to be here, since can't buy spells yet anyway. You can't really do anything to upgrade your character until you've beaten the first stage of this world. Archstone of the Small King. Yeah, but there's five Archstones, but it doesn't let you go to any of them but the first one. Archstone is sealed, yeah. You have to complete World 1-1. After that, the rest of the game will open up to you. All four of the other Archstones will open, and you can complete them in pretty much any order you want. Although you will have to complete one world before you can complete the first world. Halfway through the first world, uh, they'll put up a barrier that prevents you from continuing until you complete one other world. But I think that's only in New Game. In New Game Plus, that barrier won't be there anymore. Okay. Boletarian Palace. 
I think we were somewhere in the vicinity of this area in the tutorial. I'm not exactly sure where that was located, but I imagine it had to have been in Boletaria. Old King Duran. There's that weird mask, looks like it's made of jade. Or rust and brass. One of the two. And here we are, the first actual level, Voletarian Palace. Now, that symbol in the top right, next to the name of the area, uh, that shows you the world tendency. You don't have to open up the menu in order to see it. It will turn black and it will turn white, just to display it. Sometimes it can be difficult to tell what the exact world tendency is, because they can't just use a number like normal people. But anyway, this archstone appears here, and this will let you go back to the Nexus whenever you want, if you ever need to do some shopping or whatever. But you can't level up at all until you've beaten the first boss, who is just beyond that Porculus right over there. But in order to open the Porculus, we'll need to open a lever. A poor lever. Oh, uh, no, you don't. Don't even think you can sneak up on me. Yeah, but once you actually start playing these levels, things will get a teeny bit tougher. Right down here, there's this gate that will only open, I think, if you have either pure black or pure white well tendency. And then you have to open it while the tendency is there, and then it will stay open forever. Oh, hello, you followed me. Enemies in this game do have a range of perception. If you're wearing heavy stuff, they can hear you when you're walking. And if you walk in front of them, obviously they'll see you. And there are items that can help you be more stealthy. Like, they make you more translucent so that they can't see you when you're as far away. This fashion's actually a pretty good weapon. Oh, nah, shh. Come on, I was trying to pick up an item. Stop it. Also, enemies have this habit of just weaponly swinging their weapons back and forth. It does really low damage when they do that so frantically, but they do it multiple times in a row and it could be hard to dodge or block. So, it's a very annoying attack. Like that. Swinging back and forth like that. Without even thinking. Where'd you come from? I didn't hear you at all. But anyway, this big porculus here is closed, and the lever to open it is behind that porculus. Actually, I think the lever to open it is on top of this tower. This big one, anyway. Yeah, now that I'm actually here... Oh, come on. Stop that. You see what I mean? Once they start doing that stupid, really rapid attack, there's not much you can do. To stop them, you just have to wait for them to finish. Yeah, but now that I'm... I am playing online, which means I should be able to see other player messages and bloodstains and stuff. Unless that doesn't happen until after I beat the first boss. That's a shame. Well, let me try leaving a message. Hello? Hold on a second. Okay, I got it working now. Sometimes the server bugs out. 
and you can't hit the select button at all. Okay, so, write message. So, you can leave a warning, a hint, battle tactics, preparation, or other. Let's see. The true demon soul starts here. <laughs> yeah, this is another meme that people use. Like, whenever it's about to get really hard, people leave this message. The true Dark Soul starts here, or the true Bloodborne. I don't think Bloodborne had a message like that. Yeah, but your messages come up blue. And you can read it. The true Demon Soul starts here. You can choose to erase your message, and if you leave it there, any other player who sees it can choose to rate it up or down. Basically, higher rated messages are more likely to be believed. Oh, here's a player message. A hidden foe lies in wait ahead, warning you about some ambushes that we've already taken care of. So if you hit select while you're standing on it, you can hit recommend message. And now its rating is 2. Rated it up. Now what's the third option? Rate other player? Oh, I think that I think that's only available if somebody else is around you, like another player is actually in your world, either as a friendly ghost or an invader. Okay, but that's all I really wanted to show. I'm not in body form, so I can't summon anybody. You actually need to wait quite a while before that's even available to you. Which stinks. But let's read some other messages. Remember. Remember what? Oh, I think they're making a joke about this dead horse. Yes, yes, poor dead horse model with blood right in front of its mouth. Oh, that's actually a bloodstain. We can examine this. Looks like some noob got killed by the normal enemies. That's sad, bro. Get good. Be wary of the enemy's ambush. That is also a good message. Now, not all messages left by players appear at the same time. If you wait a while, these messages will vanish, and new ones will appear. There are some messages that have probably been here since 2009. But you can't see them all at the same time. It cycles through them. So, every time you see a good message, rate it up. Because it might be the only message another player sees. More bloodstains? How many people are dying in this first area? Really? That guy's trying to punch them. What do you expect would happen? That guy's not even trying to block or dodge or anything. Yeah, typically you find the most bloodstains in beginner areas like this. Just people trying to figure out how to play the game because they think it's a hack and slash. They think they can just waltz in and do this and win. Then they run out of fatigue and they wonder why they're taking so much damage and why they can't block or roll. Over here. Use fire on the next enemy. That's a hint for the boss. We don't have the gate open yet, but when we do fight it, we'll be using as much fire as we can get our hands on. Use spells in the next enemy. Well, I don't have any spells. I didn't start with any spells. So, I'm just going to have to settle for... Let's see. Where are they? I know I picked some up. Weird. I thought I picked up some fire bombs. Well, I'm sure I will later on. In the meantime, uh, let me unequip this grass so I don't accidentally use it. I'd rather stick with the weakest grass for now as long as my health is this low. And as long as I have so much of it. Now the dagger... You haven't seen me fight with the dagger yet, but typically daggers have really high crit rates. And what that means is if you parry and then riposte them, or if you backstab them, it does more damage than usual. I think regular Vipos and Backstabs do double damage, and Daggers do triple damage. Oh, this is a good bloodstain. You can see this guy just running out there, not paying attention to the enemies. And then he gets... Oh no, he actually fell in that hole over there and died. Wow. 
Yeah, don't fall in holes unless you know what's under them. That that should just be common sense. It's not safe here. And what do you know? It's not. If I'd stayed there, that guy would have shot me. <laughs> it's not a very good message then, is it? Because you go over to read it, and then you get shot in the back. See, this is this is what the game wants you to do. It wants you to dick with people. It wants you to make traps for other people. It wants you to invade them and kill them. That's how it's designed. It rewards you for it. So, you can either be a hero and play fairly, or you can be a dick and screw everyone over. Or a mix of both. You really do have a lot of freedom when it comes to the online components of these games. Except in Demon Souls. Because in order to play with other people, you need to be in body form. Which, as I've explained, typically isn't a good idea. And don't worry, they fix all of this mess in later games. They make online much more accessible. Demon Souls is the least online compatible of the series, and that's just because it was their first time trying this new thing of theirs. Also, pretty much everything in these games is destructible. You can break almost anything. And everything can be knocked around. Ragdoll physics everywhere. But, apart from actually summoning somebody to show you what this game is like with a co-op partner, there's really not much else that can be said. I mean, typically they'll heal themselves with their own items, and they can help you fight the boss. And if you ever get invaded, there's a couple of things you can do to actually handle the invader. You can actually, you can either kill them yourself, which, if they're invading, chances are you're not going to stand a chance because they're usually really good players that do that. You can rush to the boss, and as soon as you enter the boss's arena, then that will make them go away because they can't follow you into the boss room. They can't interrupt you when you're trying to defeat the boss. And they can't invade you in an area where you've already defeated the boss. So, you can safely farm in places where the boss is dead. Although I still wouldn't recommend being in body form. Unless you're trying to get the world tendency as black as you possibly can get it. Yeah, and if somebody else summons you to their world and you help them kill the boss, not only will you get a share of all the souls that you and the host collected during your quest to the boss, but I think, I think you can be summoned when you're in soul form and successfully aiding them with the boss will return you to body form. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. I haven't really played online enough in this game to know. But, this first episode has gone on for way too long. I pretty much just wanted to introduce all these concepts to you. From this point forward, I'm going to be playing an offline mode, and I'm going to make a new character off-screen because Whenever I make characters in Dark Souls games, it always takes me forever to adjust their appearance to exactly the way I want it and figure out what class I want to start as, figure out what build I want to use. I want to try showing everything. I want to try showing all the different kinds of spells and all the different kinds of weapons. But the only effective way to do that would be to raise all of my stats evenly, which typically isn't a good idea. Unless... You're in a situation like mine, where you can grind for hours each night, because you're doing a let's play of it, and you only play for an hour or two per day. So that's probably what I'm going to end up doing. I'm probably going to raise all of my stats evenly in order to show off as much as I can. Since I'll be doing tons of level grinding, it should make up for the evened out stats. No min-maxing in this playthrough. When I play Dark Souls, I'm going to be doing something completely different. I'm actually going to be playing through the entire game twice with two different characters in order to show off everything that way. But with a game as difficult as Demon Souls, because this game is much more difficult than Dark Souls for me, I'm probably just going to play it the one time, try and see as much as I possibly can, and then that'll be it. So. That is it for the first episode. Thank you all so very much for watching. If you liked this episode, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, because I really appreciate it. If you want to support me on Patreon, there will be an end card at the end of the video, and a link in the description below, alongside links to my social media. So, I'll see you all in the next video.
Did I spin the other way? I don't know. I wouldn't recommend trying. Oh, you can't. It doesn't seem like this should work. Because it's still magic. <laughs> it's still hitting you. <laughs> oh. What? You kissed a frog. Gonna do a prince. <laughs> Fashion princess. <laughs> She's a princess.